Hello, hello, hello again, and welcome to Adult Education. Now move from Sunday to Wednesday evenings at 7. And uh, so I'm hoping that you can join us for the Zoom class because the class discussions will only get better if you come and participate in it. Of course, you can benefit from these lectures and get something to go from that, I hope. Uh, but at any rate, I think the real payoff is to be in the class discussion where having read through or watched through some of the material that we present here, we can then explore together and have some real interesting conversation about it. We are in studies in Genesis. This is lecture three. And I uh, want to do just a brief recap of where we have been so far. We've talked about interpretative principles, or the fancy term for that is hermeneutics, and how that is so important because the interpretative principles that we employ to a great extent determine our results and our outcome. If we have poor interpretative principles or ones that are not valid, then that is going to naturally result in an interpretation of the text which is probably not going to be valid either. Uh, so we want to just kind of go through this briefly again, some of the basic interpretative principles that we're using here. First of all, we want to study with a Hebrew way of thinking as opposed to Greek. And I included a handout that basically outlines some of that for us. But we want to approach it from the standpoint of the original hearers of this text. And when I say original hearers, that's assuming that when Genesis was written, most people didn't know how to read. And so they gained information and knowledge by what they heard. We want to study it through a Hebraic or a Hebrew lens of understanding. And that's very different from Greek. We also want to study this passage of scripture with an understanding of the cultural backdrop. In other words, what was the prevailing culture of the Middle East at that time? And what can we understand of the message of Genesis, putting it against that backdrop? And what we see is that the message of Genesis begins to come into sharp relief focus for us when we study the background and the backdrop. Thirdly, we want to study Genesis with the church in mind, the church through the ages. I'm not talking about the Lutheran church or Protestants or Roman Catholic or anything of that. I'm talking about the church as a whole, the church as a continuing community which was founded by Jesus Christ and which has or has had up until quite recently a fairly consensus kind of understanding as to the message of the Bible and the message of a book like Genesis. What has the church understood? Or to put it another way, St. Vincent of Larens, who I think was fifth century, put it this way, what has the church believed at all times and in all places and believed by all people? That really is the standard that we're looking at. And so we're not looking at um, Roman Catholic versus Protestant versus Baptist or Calvinist or whatever, what has the church believed? And that's, that's one of our interpretative lenses. We allow history, we allow tradition to inform us as to the interpretive process. And then finally, we want to read and study Genesis with a Christ-centered focus. And that in itself is a hermeneutical principle. That is something that as pastors, uh, we always try to do at least the pastors here try to do that. And what I mean by a Christ-centered focus, if you're wondering what the emphasis of that is, because naturally Jesus uh, was not incarnated until uh, we get up to the New Testament period and the books of the New Testament talk about Jesus. And what we mean by that is that think of the Bible and the books of the Bible as something like a bicycle wheel you have the outer rim and you've got the spokes which connect that rim to the hub of the wheel. Now, the whole structure, the hub, the wheel, everything, is what we would call the unity of the Bible. It forms a single message with a single purpose to it, even though it's had many authors and 
took centuries really to uh, uh, to to come into its one volume form nowadays. But the Bible forms a unity because it does have ultimately one author, and that author is God himself. And so there's going to be a unity and consistency in the message. But each of the books of the Bible have a different focus. And those books are kind of like the spokes of the bicycle wheel. And all of the spokes connect in the center to the hub. And the hub is Jesus Christ, his person, and his finished work through his death, resurrection, and ascension. So in some way, shape, or form, every passage of the Bible has some kind of connection to Christ. And if you follow that line, just like you follow the spoke, it's going to eventually end up at the hub. I remember a number of years ago, a friend of mine, we were in a conversation about some scriptural matters, and he said, you know, Pastor Eric, you, you find Jesus everywhere in scripture. And I think he meant it slightly as a criticism, but I took it as a compliment and I said, thank you. Because in reality, that's what we have with the Bible. We have something like a bicycle wheel with all of the spokes leading to the hub. And that's an interpretative principle that I think is very important. Um, finally, before we launch into the material for this week, I want to say and reiterate again that Genesis is a counterculture text. In other words, when Genesis was put together, Moses, the author, realized that the story of Genesis is in marked contrast to any other creation story or account of beginnings that was in the ancient Near East at the time. And as such, it was going to confront those cultures with a with, with a different theology, with a different focus, which is very important because naturally we're talking about a different God. Genesis is a counterculture text which challenges the prevailing culture. Genesis is also a culture forming or a culture creating text in that through the message of Genesis, the people who came to be known as Israelites, and then later on the Jews, and then later on the Christian church, formed their identity around the data that we have in the book of Genesis. It's a very important book. Now, I want to, at this point, break away from the introductory material and cover rather briefly this handout that you would have received in an email. We're gonna send it out again in case you can't find the link. But this handout, 1-1, one, one, uh, called We Confess, We Reject. And this really gives you sort of a compendium of theological thought of things which are comprised in, in Genesis chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 4a. And this is a handy way of seeing exactly how Genesis, Genesis differs from the prevailing culture and how Genesis challenges the religion and the theology of that culture. And I'm going to go through it right now uh, so that you can really capture some of the thrust of Genesis 1 to 2. First of all, we confess that there is only one God. We reject that there are many gods, like all of the other cultures around Israel believed in. Secondly, we confess God is not a sexual being with a female counterpart or wife or wives. We reject that there are male and female deities. Hebrew does not have a word for goddess. This is very important as we keep in mind who God is and the fact that consistently, without fail, the Bible refers to God as he and as later on with Jesus as our father. That does not mean that God has a sexuality the way that we relate to that term as male and female human beings. It does refer to the fact, however, that in relation to all of creation, and in particular in relation to us as people, God is always male and we are always female. You might recall that the New Testament teaches that the church is the bride of Christ. That analogy or that illustration is not without purpose. It's not without a point to it. Thirdly, we confess God created through his all-powerful word. 
We reject that the gods used pre-existing materials in, created, in the creative process. Four, we confess that the sun, moon, and stars are lamps which God has set in place to provide light and divide time. We reject that the heavenly lamps are deities which people must worship. Five, we confess history has a beginning and is directed towards a final goal. The very first words of Genesis, or in, in Hebrew, it's really one word, better sheet, but in our language, in the beginning. And uh, so we confess that history has a beginning and it has an end or a goal. We reject that humanity is locked into a closed, repetitious cycle of history that goes nowhere. Six, we confess the creation of humanity was the high point of the creative process. We reject that humanity was an afterthought in the creative process. And think of what that does to your anthropology if you think that human beings were an afterthought of the gods or came about sort of by accident or because of warfare. Uh, very different kind of anthropology. Six, or, or seven rather. We confess humanity was created to live in a loving I-thou relationship with God and to exercise, <coughs> excuse me, responsible dominion over the created order on behalf of God. And so the calling of humanity, if you will, uh, from God's perspective, from the perspective of Genesis, is a high calling. We are co-regents with God. We exercise dominion with God. We are given responsibility over the entire world. We reject that humanity was created as servants or as slaves to do the God's dirty work on earth. Eight, we confess that the created order brings forth its fruits in response to God's controlling hand and word of command. Genesis 1, 11, and 12. We reject humanity's manipulation of the gods through sexual rites, the fertility cults, uh, which would move nature to provide her bounty. In other words, God's providence has nothing to do with whether we perform certain religious rites or not. And that is very different from the surrounding culture of the day. Maybe it's different from our culture too, a culture which would seek to somehow, if there is a God, to manipulate God. Nine, we confess that God's purposes in creation were good and that the created order is inherently good. We reject that God is in some way responsible for the evil that exists in creation. 10, we confess creation came into existence in an orderly fashion. God is a God of order. We reject that creation came into existence as the result of a chaotic struggle between the gods. 11, we confess that order continues in creation because of God's sovereign command and rule. We reject the idea that continuing order in creation depends upon us, depends upon the rituals that human beings perform. And right there, that pretty much kicks the slats out of most religious practice in the Middle East at that time. And finally, 12, we confess that it is important for humanity to render to God praise and worship and keeping one day set apart for that purpose. If God saw fit to rest on the Sabbath, it is important for humanity to follow his example. We reject that how or whether one worships God is a matter of human choice. And so at the very beginning, at the very outset in the book of Genesis, uh, God has a certain structure or pattern for worship. So, um, Take that sheet, study it, uh, use each of those uh, to kind of meditate on those things and, and even apply some of that to our culture and ask the question, are there parallels between the ancient Near East and their perception of God and creation with what people believe nowadays? That might be a very interesting study on your part. Well, let's get to the text of Genesis. And we are, of course, in the beginning of that text, Genesis 1, verse 1. And uh, just for the sake of information and reference point, Genesis 1, 1, actually, that first chapter of Genesis, the section actually goes all the way up to chapter 2, verse 4. And at 2, verse 4, 
the narrative of the first chapter is concluded and then a new narrative begins which is also a creation narrative but it's a different story entirely different style from genesis chapter one so we essentially have kind of two creation accounts within the book of genesis in the first two chapters well genesis 1 1 through 2 4 general observations first of all there is rhythm and there's repetition and you can see that repetition and rhythm throughout the first chapter then god said and it was so and god saw that it was good and there was evening and morning you see that again and again and again what is the reason for rhythm and repetition it reinforces the idea that god created the heavens and the earth in an orderly methodical deliberate fashion the meaning of uh, rhythm and repetition also seems to lend itself to poetry and there is a poetic nature to this first chapter of genesis it's not so much a story it's a depiction in poetic language of how god made how god created the heavens and the earth there's an even a sort of majesty to it as as we look at that uh, passage second observation god's creative acts they basically come down to these two things god populates in other words he fills his universe and he separates he divides and he defines this idea of separation and distinction we've already alluded to in previous classes that begins to take on a highly religious significance for the israelite culture there are spiritual and moral connotations to god's act of separation and definition and distinction in the hebraic religion we find that things are divided into holy and common it's not necessarily that anything is wrong with commonplace things but there came to be a distinction made between that which was holy or set apart and that which was for common use. And once again, the idea that there was a separation of these things predated by quite a bit the idea that there was necessarily anything, any sort of moral connotation to that. Holy and common are both good categories. But it also came to mean at a certain point that there are certain things that were clean and things that were unclean. And the unclean things uh, needed to be avoided. It eventually came down to a distinction between what is good and what is evil. And what is holy was associated with what is good. It came to mean a distinction between natural and unnatural. And so when we begin to look at the dietary restrictions upon the Israelites in the book of Leviticus, we are in some degree looking at a distinction between animals with what we call natural traits as opposed to things that didn't seem to quite add up um, sea creatures with legs didn't seem to add up and so phew, shrimp is off the menu um, those kinds of distinctions came along later now let's make some detailed observations in genesis chapter one we start off with the creation of light and light is good and so we have evening and morning the first day why does the pattern why does the rhythm begin with evening and morning why is it that jews count the sabbath as beginning not with sunrise but with sunset as soon as the sun goes down that's the beginning of the sabbath day it is because god created in darkness his first creative act was to say let there be light and light shined in the darkness and because of that pattern that darkness precedes light it seems natural or it, it, it seems uh, uh, on the part of the thinking the mind of god to begin with evening and then move to morning now with evening with sundown in an agricultural society naturally man rests from his work but in a hebrew understanding when the sun goes down god works god works through the watches of the night and so by the time that we wake up with the sun first thing in the morning 
really from a Hebraic understanding, the day is already half spent. Now think about that in terms of the implications of God's grace. That all that we do as human beings is that we enter into the work God has already been doing. God has already laid the, uh, uh, set the stage. He's already set the table, and we enter into that work. That is a sign of God's grace. God has already done the heavy lifting. We simply enter into the work that he has done. And so the Hebrew custom of beginning Sabbath with sundown comes from this understanding of the setup of light and darkness. Day two, separation of the waters. Once again, the heavens were seen as one body of waters, and then, of course, there are waters on the face of the earth. And there is a separation of those two, very different from the Enuma Elish legend. If you will remember that, you can refer back to the handout. Day three, water is separated from dry land, another act of separation and vegetation begins to appear. Day four, there are lights. Now, this is a good practice in observation of language in the biblical text. Where is the sun and moon mentioned in Genesis chapter one? And think about that for a moment. And the answer is this, the sun and moon are never mentioned in Genesis chapter 1, and that is deliberate on the part of the Mosaic author. The sun and moon were Babylonian deities. Moses did not even want to dignify these deities by naming them or by even calling them the sun or the moon. Notice that the Genesis text refers to them as the greater and the lesser light. And here again, we see the countercultural aspect of Genesis. Rather than worshiping sun and moon, rather than even dignifying them with a name, they're simply lamps that God has placed over our world. And that is profound. Uh, this is not a multi or uh, uh, many theistic religion. This is monotheism. And the lights are the servants of God. They are objects which God has created, and he has created them for our good not for us to worship them. And so um, the greater, the lesser light, day four. Day five, sea creatures and birds appear, sea monsters. Interesting that it says God created sea monsters. They're not a, uh, a result of the fall. Um, they were created by God. And interestingly, the same word which is used for God creating humanity is used of his creation of the sea creatures. There are two creation words, by the way, two verbs being used in Genesis chapter one. One is asa, which is to make stuff. Human beings can asa things into being. We can make things, we can form and we can fashion things. But bara is the uh, term of creation and only God can bara something into existence. And very significantly, that is the term that is used in Genesis 1.27 to describe God's creation of man. It takes that different word. But God also created sea monsters. I don't have a ready explanation for that. I'm just telling you what's in the text. And God then commands these creatures to be fruitful and multiply. That's echoed once again in day six. Living creatures on land are created and of course, man is created and god says let us create man in our image a lot of speculation as to that um, we as christians know and understand that what is being alluded to here uh, is eventually um, uh, clarified for us as the trinity some say that god is using the, mat, the language of the majestic we, just like the Queen of England sometimes does when she addresses the nation in official capacity. That can be true too. But the we signifies once again, we talked about this last week, that God is one. We certainly agree with that, but God is not a monad. God is not a simple being in that there are no, no moving parts or moving personages within God. 
we understand that God is complex in the fact that God is three and yet one. And so it makes sense that the text would say, let us make man in our image. Now notice what is being said when it is said in our image according to our likeness. And what is being said there is, first of all, that this is going to be the culmination of creation because man alone bears the image and likeness of God at creation. Secondly, the idea of image. What is the imago Dei or the image of God? Well, going to the text, uh, chapter 1, verse 26, dominion is, is mentioned. And, and again, in our text, it says, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and so on. At the very outset, God's design for man was to have dominion, and that, uh, in a very real sense, is in the image of, of God. But notice also this implication. When God says, let us make man in our image, in our image, now that doesn't mean that you and I, as human beings, are tritheistic beings, or that there's three of us inside of each of us. Um, what it does mean is that man in the image of God is a communal being. God is communal in his very essence because he is triune. And so um, I believe that Pastor Joe preached a little bit on this uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, but uh, the Trinity suggests that man in the image of God is actually man in community with one another. That's profound. Don't have time to go through all the implications of that. Finally, the text says, let us make man in our image. And then we are told in verse 27, and God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. All right. And then this very important phrase, male and female, he created them. Who bears the image of God? Just males? No, male and female together bear the image of God. Now I have to caution and say, this does not mean that if you happen to be single, if you happen not to be a married person, that you bear the image of God any less than somebody who is married or a married couple does. What it does mean is that both sexes are equal bearers of the image of God. Now, once more, the question of who or what is the image of God in ancient Middle East, who was in God's image? And, I, and I'm talking about culture in general. Who bore the image of God upon earth in the ancient Middle East? And if you said idols, you would be right about that. The idols were seen to be the images of the gods, but also quite significantly, the king or the pharaoh, whoever was on the throne was the bearer of the image of God upon the earth. That person on the throne was God's regent or the regent of the gods. Now, in ancient Middle East culture, the king and the king alone really was the bearer of God's image, which meant that if he is the image of God on earth, then we better do what he has to say. But now, take the implication this way. When Genesis says that God created man in his image and likeness, what happens to that uh, organizational chart, so to speak? What happens to that hierarchy? It begins to collapse into a flatness because if we're all created in God's image, if we all bear the image of God equally, then what's that guy on the throne doing thinking that he's somebody really, really special? Not that God didn't place him there, but it certainly begins to level things out a little bit. And this idea of who is truly uh, given the right to be sovereign, this played out many, 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 many centuries later in the 14th century as some English divines at Oxford began to discuss the question of sovereignty and is it possible that an entire people could in themselves have sovereignty?
And of course, these kinds of concepts eventually led to our modern concept of democracy. Wow, there's a trajectory being set here in the very first lines of Genesis. Well, 127, uh, the verse about the creation of man is uh, a poetic verse. It's got its own meter in the book. Um, 128, again, the command to be fruitful and multiply. It's the first command given to humans in the Bible. And 131, notice that the pattern is broken. God saw that it was very good. And that is the uh, divine blessing upon the creation of man as male and female. And then we're to day seven. And seven uh, in Hebrew, Shiva. Shiva means seven, but it also means, and it comes from a root word meaning stop. And on day seven, creation stops because God stops and God rests from his works. And you see the pattern which is being set up for us human beings in that pattern. And so think of it, those of you who are even the slightest bit musical, as a musical pattern. And it comes very naturally to us. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Rest. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Rest. And that's the pattern of life. We, as God's creatures, bearing his image, are meant to live in a life which, like the creation of God, is orderly, which is communal, which expresses unity and purpose, not chaos, and expresses a rhythmic nature to it. We are meant to, <laughs> for want of a better language, we're, we're, we're meant to live at a deliberate pace. Think about that as you deal with your frenetic schedules and um, uh, perhaps uh, your overscheduled life and understand that God means for us to live uh, perhaps every single day in his rest, in the Sabbath rest that he has provided for us in the person of Jesus Christ and in his work. I'll leave you with that. I uh, hope to see all of you in our Zoom class on Wednesday night. May God bless you and hope this uh, particular study today has blessed you and informed you in God's word. We'll see you later. God bless you.